because uh, although we've worked, I guess we've overlapped at Sheffield for probably 12 years and known each other for that long, we still have arguments with each other that are based on things like terminology and misunderstandings of philosophies and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but the, an area where um, Gaussian processes have found a lot of success in statistics is this rather, ironically given we're computer science, is this area of emulating computer code. So uh, it's something that uh, Jeremy's originally your PhD supervisor at uh, Nottingham, Tony O'Hagan, who's um, one of the sort of pioneers of Gaussian processes. Um, indeed, uh, his, his name is used to initialize the Gaussian process that is uh, forming the logo on the web page, not the logo on the pad. Remember, all those logos are sampled separately. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Tony was Jeremy's supervisor, and Tony and Jeremy and, uh, uh, really formed a whole community of people who were using Gaussian processes to emulate very expensive computer code. So if you've got simulations that take a very long time to run, you can fit those simulations with the Gaussian process and, and run this emulator rather than the simulator. And I, I think he's going to tell us uh, all about that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> Right. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation uh, and the introduction. I'm looking forward to continued discussion of terminology as we go through. Um, but please do feel free to interrupt and heckle um, as, I, as I go along. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, sort of branch and statistics, if you like, concerned with analysing uncertainty in computer models and physical systems, where we use Gaussian processes a lot. So um, talk about the problems, um, applications of Gaussian processes and the sort of stream of consciousness about things we've tried and what works and what doesn't and so on. Right, so start off with explain what I mean by a computer model. So very simply, we just think of this as a function. Well, we've got some inputs x, some outputs y, and we have a computer model that you specify your inputs and it gives you the outputs. And usually you imagine that, that we don't have a simple that the, the relationship between inputs and outputs is sufficiently complex that we don't have a, a closed form expression for what that function is. So maybe y is calculated by solving numerically some system of differential equations or something like that. Uh, x will be typically be a, a vector. Um, the sort of applications I work with might be looking about sort of 20 to 30 parameters that you can vary independently of each other. Um, you might have a more complicated input that takes the form of time series or even a spatial field. But for the moment, just uh, think of x as a bunch of separate scalar quantities. Um, in the examples I'll be talking about, y will be um, a scalar output, but again, could be um, a collection of quantities measuring different types of things, or it could be a time series output or a spatial field or something like that. So we so we've used the term computer model to sort of try and emphasize the fact that this model, it's not a statistical model. It's based on understanding of the underlying physics. So different names that people use, sometimes they call them substantive or law-driven, as opposed to being an empirical or statistical model. Uh, in particular, um, you might not have any physical XY data in terms of constructing the model. So in some cases, you're building these models precisely because you can't do the physical experiment. You can't get the x's and y's to... You can't experiment in the physical world by varying the inputs and seeing what outputs you get. So you build this, often you build this model because you don't have any physical data. Um, F is usually deterministic. Um, doesn't have to be, and I think in the early days, everyone was sort of working in the community was interested in deterministic models, but there's a lot of interest now in stochastic models where um, possibly your model is doing some internal simulation to get the output, which introduces noise into the, into the model. And then when we talk about a computer experiment, what we mean is we evaluate our function f at different choices of input. So we try out different input values and we see what outputs we get. We just think of that as being the computer experiment as opposed to a physical experiment where you can actually get physical data. And then I'll refer to a model run as choosing one cho uh, a single choice of my inputs, plugging them into my computer code and getting the output. So model run first, evaluating that f once, one choice of input. 
Okay, so um, what might we want to do with these models? Um, various problems that sort of have statistical flavours. Um, so we might start off with optimization. So we want to find what input values to, to use to produce either the maximum output or output in a particular range. And then sort of, I suppose it's kind of related on the same theme, we might try and calibrate our models to sort of limited physical data. So it's a similar idea, you're, you're looking, searching for inputs that when you plug them into the model and run them, you get output values that, that uh, match observed data, or as close as possible. Um, another thing we're interested in is uncertainty propagation. So now there's two ways to think about this. We can imagine that there's a single sort of fixed uncertain input that we don't know, some, some input that best describes reality, but we're uncertain about it. And we want to understand uncertainty in the corresponding output. So if I could find out what that was, and I can run that input through my model, what output would I get? Or it may be that you might actually have um, a population of input values, so something you know, varies from one occasion to the next. It produces a population of input values, and you'd like to know what the population distribution of output values are. And then extending this, if we imagine we've got a vector output, a vector input, sorry, um, we might want to understand how particular elements in that uncertain input vector contribute to the uncertainty in the output. So perhaps I might invest some resources in reducing my uncertainty about some of the inputs. I might spend some money. Is it worth spending money reducing uncertainty about input x1? Would that give me a worthwhile reduction in the output uncertainty? OK, so it's our first terminology argument. So this is a sort of semi-recent buzzword that's become quite popular. Um, so uh, we tend to call this statistical analysis of, of computer models, but there's, uh, the applied maths community have got very interested in related problems, and, and they tend to, to badge them uncertainty quantification. Um, so that's something that you might hear, which often is, is um, related to the same sorts of problems. Um, one interesting thing, though, is that where we tend to do everything with Gaussian processes, a lot of the sort of applied maths people looking at these problems try other things. They're quite interested in... in polynomial chaos um, type models. So maybe in 10 years time one community will be telling the other I told you so, but we're still waiting to see. Right, uh, so where does the Gaussian process fit in? Well, often these models are computationally expensive. So to do a single run, just to observe your output once, for one single x, takes a non-trivial amount of computing time. So the idea is you can only afford, you've only got time to do a limited number of model runs, so you might choose some input values and observe some outputs, but you'd like to know the output at many other input values. Okay? So by now, you should all appreciate this is kind of false natural, in the, ter ter false natural in the territory of a Gaussian process modelling. I want to do inference for a function given limited observations about that function. So this is sort of uh, thing that we're talking about. So let's say we've got a one-dimensional model. We might choose a small number of input points. We run the model, and then we can fit a Gaussian process to it. Now, usually we're working with deterministic models, so if I was to run the model twice at input value, the same input value, I will observe exactly the same output. So one of the nice things about the Gaussian process type model, as you should already have seen, is that you don't put any noise um, in your covariance function and it interpolates the data exactly and you get zero uncertainty where you've got a training point and then your uncertainty grows as you move away from the training data. Okay, so we're looking at Gaussian process um, models for functions. Now just a few characteristics that perhaps are a little bit different from some of the applications you've been looking at so far. Um, so I've already mentioned that the function is deterministic, well it's usually deterministic, although as I've said there is now growing interest in non-deterministic functions as well, but all the examples I'll be presenting will be at deterministic functions. Um, there's usually a premium on the, a smaller train, train data set as possible. Okay? Now, you know, this function is available to us, so we can plug in, we can observe what the output would be for the input. So if you can do that quickly, there's nothing to be gained by, coming up with a by bothering with a Gaussian process. 
um, the motivation of the Gaussian process is that it takes too long to calculate your output and every input you're interested in. So um, we're always interested in having doing things with as little training data as possible. But we can choose the training data. So we can choose what inputs uh, we observe to we, we're going to observe our outputs out. So that introduces sort of features of um, experimental design. You know, what are good choices of input training inputs for, for learning the function? Um, sometimes we have this sort of characteristic where um, you have different levels of model for the same thing, or you can run the model at different speeds for the same thing. So, sort of broadly referred to this as multi-level computer models. So you might think of a something like a finite element model where you choose a mesh size and the finer your mesh size, the longer the model takes to run. But perhaps the more precise you think the outputs are going to be, the more accurate they're going to be. So you might have choices of um, fast but coarse model runs, or slow and accurate model runs, or continuum in, in between. Uh, more interesting is when you might have actually just completely separate models for the uh, for the um, for the same thing. But 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 certainly sort of I'll refer back to this a bit later on. We have imagine you've got different levels of complexity for the same thing. Okay, so just a little bit of a uh, sort of history to this. Um, now, I'm not certain of this, but I think in the computer experiments literature, uh, the first example of someone using a Gaussian process as a way of learning a computer model function uh, was this uh, Saxthorpe paper in here, uh, and they did it from a sort of Krieging um, perspective. So a couple of years later, uh, there was a um, a Bayesian version. Now, um, I'll talk about this a bit more later. The Bayesian sort of interpretation is very natural for the sorts of things we're interested in. But if you're not fussed about the interpretation and you only care about numbers, then there's not really much to choose between them. Um, certainly, when you look at people doing what they call Bayesian type emulators, non Bayesian e emulators, they're both using Gaussian processes. There's in practice, there's, there's, there's very little difference in terms of the numbers that come out. So uh, I think it's a, it's a helpful way to think about it, but I don't think it, in practice, it doesn't add a, a great deal to um, the sort of Krieging approach that was originally proposed. Um, I mentioned this one. Um, so I, I, I referred to optimization as one of the problems we're interested in. I'm not going to say anything about optimization, so I just thought I'd give this reference here. I think this is one of the earlier um, examples of using a Gaussian process to approximate a computer model and then do optimization on the Gaussian process. Um, but I think that's been quite an influential paper in the sort of Gaussian process optimization literature. Um, and then just something else I'll mention, uh, so I was involved in, with a few other people here, a project that ran for six years called Muckham, Managing Uncertainty in Computer Models. And that was looking at various sort of Gaussian process and other related things. Now the project is finished, but if you go to the website, um, we're now sort of linking, trying to link to other research groups working in this area. So it's, to start with at least, it's not a bad place to go just to find out who's doing what um, uh, in the computer models field. It's not exhaustive by any means, but, but there's some useful stuff there. And one of the things we did was we um, produced a thing called a toolkit, perhaps not the best name for it. It's essentially an ebook, really, um, but we've tried to sort of put a lot of discussion and a bit more detail behind the papers on, on how things are implemented. So just a couple of places that you might look to see a bit more about things that have been done. Okay, so on to the Gaussian process emulators then. Um, so the first thing to say is that um, you know, people are very good at coming up with different names for the same thing. So there's lots of different names that people use. Uh, the sort of idea of, of Gaussian process models. So we've got surrogate models, response surface models, meta models, and then the words that's kind of stuck uh, in the community is emulator, so that's what I'm going to call them. Now, we think of an emulator as a probability distribution for the function. So the idea is that um, we don't want to just estimate the function, we are interested in quantifying uncertainty, and in particular, because in real problems, we're working with small training data samples. So we're not going to have a, you know, a perfect replication of the function. There is going to be uncertainty, and we want to quantify it. So we tend to use the word emulator to distinguish the fact that we're not just coming up with 
an estimate of the function and we're coming up with a probability distribution that can give us an estimate but can also quantify the uncertainty. Um, now, in terms of the interpretation, it's quite natural to think of this in a, in a sort of Bayesian way. In particular, there's no true probability distribution for f. People don't randomly generate computer models from distributions of computer models. Okay, so it's a fixed thing. We're just uncertain about it. So even though this function is available, if you want to, you can plug in an input and get an output. Um, it's effort to do that. You can't get the output of all the inputs you want. So we have uncertainty about what the output will be for any input value. So we treat it um, as an uncertain function. So the idea is that we're going to use a Gaussian process to sort of model our uncertainty about f. Now occasionally there's a bit of confusion here and, and you, you know, people saying things like you can't do this with my model because my model's not Gaussian. Now in, that, in our sense that doesn't make any sense. The model have, doesn't have any distribution. We're just using a Gaussian process as a subjective way representing our uncertainty about a deterministic function. The other important thing to emphasize, and this, this worries some people, is that um, we're not trying to replace the model with a Gaussian process. Um, I was involved in one project and I heard someone say, oh, my model's got real biology in it. You're not throwing it away just so you can use some emulator. Okay? Um, that's not what we're doing. And I think the word emulator sometimes introduces a little bit of confusion. One way you might think about it is like this. In our experiment, we're interested in our outputs at a whole bunch of input values. X1 up to capital N. But because it, the model takes too long to run, we can only evaluate our output at a small number of input values, little n. And so in the process of doing our analysis for whatever it is we're interested in, one of the things we're going to be working with would be a distribution of the runs that we haven't done given the runs that we have done. And the emulator is the way that, that we set out our beliefs so that we can get this distribution. Okay? So, if you want to, you could ignore the word emulator and say what we're really doing is we're just working with a probability distribution for the runs that we can't do given the runs that we can do. Okay, okay so go through some emulator modeling choices now. Now, this is where I'm probably going to get into trouble because we write things a little bit differently as to how you've seen the machine learning community. So, I'll talk about how we do it and then try and tie the two together. Uh, afterwards. So the convention, um, sort of in the sort of circles that I work in, is that we specify what I refer to as sort of like a hierarchical GP model, but we separate our unknown function into two bits. Okay? So this thing here uh, we call the mean function. So for example, if you've got a scalar input, you might have a, uh, a linear term there. Okay? And then this term here will be a zero mean Gaussian process, and usually stationary, and we sometimes refer to this as a residual process. It's what's left after the, the uh, you've got the mean function. And one way you can think about this is that what we're doing with a Gaussian process is that we are improving upon a, a parametric model. So you might have some it's going to be a sort of linear in the parameters B, so you might have some quite complex model here, your sort of favourite parametric regression model. We've got a function that's deterministic, so it does pass through all the observations, and our parametric model isn't able to perfectly pass through all the points, so the Gaussian process corrects the parametric part and deviates you away, away through the, to, to go through the points. And then one sort of feature of the mean function is that what it's doing is that we're putting in trends so that we can use a stationary Gaussian process um, uh, for this part here. Okay? So um, we've got a zero mean for our residual process, we have a specified covariance function for, our, for the Gaussian process. Um, so um, Different choices, so we might use now what's the word exponentiated quadratic. Nice. Um, that's the one I, 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 I tend to work with, um, but people use um, different functions. I find for sort of applications I work with, this seems to generally be fine and it's got some nice analytic properties. Um, but I find sometimes talking to statisticians, they're like plumbers. You 
tell them what you've done and they sort of go oh, oh I wouldn't use that oh no it's far too smooth for what you want but so there are certainly applications where people use different functions in return or so on and they get better results but certainly this, this does a good job for lots of things um, and then we've got prior uh, um, uncertain parameters now the thetas generally we kind of don't handle properly we're just going to plug in estimates but for the betas which is the coefficients of the mean function and the variance parameter sigma squared which is describing how far the residual process deviates from the mean typically people assume um, uh, an improper non-formative prior um, I did years ago have a go at thinking about eliciting a proper prior distribution for this but my feeling is that the information you get isn't worth it in terms of just a you know, few extra model ones. So you're, you're assuming that the beta coefficients are, are constrained positive uh, for the mean function? No, no. not beta. Not beta, so I, oh, right, so you're using the same, okay, I was confused. Well, what, what, what we're doing is, is we're actually using a limiting case of the normal inverse gamma, so sigma squared is an oh, inverse right. gamma. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Beta has a flat normal conditional on sigma squared. Um, and then, I won't bother putting up the equations, but you get your training data, and for a fixed theta, which you might estimate estimates separately, um, posterior distribution of f, it's a t-process, because we integrate out sigma squared, but it's a t-process with lots of degrees of freedom, so it's not really going to be any different from a Gaussian. Um, the beta parameters and the sigma squared um, can all be integrated out of the posterior anal analytically. Um, so it's just that the theta parameters that are the difficult ones to deal with. Are the degrees of t freedom of the t process equal to the data observations? Uh, it's number of observations minus the number of things you put into your mean function. But in practice it's usually large enough that it'll be the same as Gaussian. Yeah. Now, um, so that's a slightly different way of um, uh, writing a Gaussian process to the way you've seen. So I'll try and do the same thing the machine learning way, if I've understood this right. So let's suppose, with the scalar input again, let's suppose I'm going to have a simple trend that passes through the origin and a stationary Gaussian process. Um, and I'm going to specify a prior on beta conditional on sigma squared. Um, uh, where v is going to be some number. Okay? Now in practice, what I've done there is I actually let my v tend to infinity, but that's not important now. Okay? So z is 0 being gp. So this term is going to have expectation 0. We've got 0 mean gp here, so my expectation of the function is 0. And then the covariance, if I model these two parts independently, we're going to have um, a term from uncertainty about beta there and then our usual covariance kernel there so my understanding is that this gets you back to the sort of covariance kernel that you might have used anyway if you're using the um, more general sort of stationary mean without bothering with the mean function okay? so for fixed v if you started off with this covariance function and you keep v fixed that's equivalent to the way I wrote it for a particular um, prior distribution there so you can so I don't think I don't think it practices any difference. The only thing between the specifications, the only thing I'm not sure about is in the hierarchical version, um, any parameters that go into the mean function you can integrate out analytically. Um, but I guess that anything that goes into the covariance function, apart from a common scalar, um, you'd have to do inference for numerically. So I guess there might be situations where putting things into the mean gives you an easier way of dealing with the parameters, but I'm not sure if that's right. I don't know if anyone has any comments on that. No, I think they're equivalent in the way that you've said. I mean, it's just a matter of... I think Rich and I were talking about this. I think you just in statistics, you generally care more about parametric models for interpretability reasons, and so you tend to emphasise it a bit more than we do. But you care about prediction. If I started with that function, would I... I mean, I've, would you be doing? Would you be possibly doing inference for that parameter there? The sigma squared. No, the the v parameter. The v parameter. Um, or the coefficient, if you like, of x one, x two. I wouldn't like to speak to the whole community, but I often wouldn't. Okay. Um, 
because of this issue of the, it's a tea process, but it becomes a, it becomes very those parameters become quite well determined with a large amount of data, or maybe not the v the sigma squared does, doesn't it? Anyway, anyway, um, but broadly, I don't think there's a difference, but maybe there's one or two minor details in, in implied priors or, or so on. Um, but I'm afraid I'm going to keep talking about mean functions because that's just, just a habit I can't get out of. And I, I quite, I personally, I quite like the interpretation anyway. Right, um, so I'm going to talk about choice of mean function. Now, if you like, you can think of this as a choice of covariance kernel, given this sort of equivalence between the two. But regardless of how you write it down, the choices are important. Um, now, in our context, we're often working with quite small training data sets. So you have quite large gaps um, between points, and sometimes relying on the sort of residual Gaussian process to do any, everything can be a bit of a stretch. So uh, the mean function does have a role to play of interpolating in gaps which are quite far from the training data points. Um, so in practice, when I do this, I usually stick with a fairly simple linear form. Um, you hear different things from different people. Uh, some claim that um, this kind of messes things up a bit, just puts in unnecessary parameters, and it's better to have a simple constant form. Um, one of the references I'll mention later, um, they, they go to the other extreme. They like putting in lots of higher order polynomial terms into the mean. Um, I suspect secretly they don't like Gaussian processes and they're trying to do away with them and just do everything parametrically. Um, so there's, there's a whole kind of divergence of opinion as to what goes into the mean, or if you like, what goes in, you, should, you should put in your covariance kernel. Um, sometimes, perhaps more importantly, we do have real prior information about what our complex model is doing. So if you've got this sort of case of a, a fast model, which you can, can afford to run quickly, and a slow model, which you want a Gaussian process for, you might actually think about your fast model as giving you a prior for what the slow model is going to do. Um, now you can incorporate in that into the Gaussian process, or rather than fitting a Gaussian process to the function directly, you might fit a Gaussian process to the difference between the two computer models, or you, know, you can fit a Gaussian process to any transformation that you think sensible. Um, and some people like um, actually having a, another GP for the mean, which I think broadly corresponds to um, sort of uh, different sort of covariance kernels in a covariance function. Um, so they have a second GP with a bit of noise and that kind of roughly picks up the trend and then the second Gaussian process interpolates exactly. Um, but I think I don't think this is new to machine learning people because I think it, you get the same thing from particular covariance kernels that you already use. Just to understand that correctly you would have one covariance function that has quite a long length scale or something like that yeah. moves slowly and then another one that has a shorter one, so actually interpolates precisely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Nicola might have done examples of that yesterday. Yeah. Right, uh, then correlation parameters. So again, as people do different things. Um, I think maximum likelihood is probably still the most common. Um, you do get people who will go the sort of full base route and use MCMC. Um, I submitted a paper once and I got told off by the referees for using maximum likelihood and they made me do it again with MCMC. Um, it was quite a lot of work and it didn't really change anything very much. Um, so I'm reluctant to do it um, if I can avoid it. Um, now, when I mentioned people who like to have quite complex mean functions, they actually don't bother doing inference of these things. They um, have various polynomial terms, they fix the correlation parameters in a way that they think would mop up the higher order polynomials that might be missing, and they don't do the inference. Um, I'll point to reference for that later. Um, some others have suggested an important sampling approach. I don't think this has been um, published, but it's, it's online. Um, and they seem to think that worked quite, quite easily, and um, I don't think it's doesn't seem to have caught on very much, but another option. Um, in terms of maximum likelihood, um, so I test, tend to shove things into R and, and, and hope it works, but we have found that doing a little bit of Gibbs sampling first can help you find good starting values. So um, this is an example. I had uh, 18 inputs, so I'm looking at 18 theta parameters to estimate. Just picked an arbitrary starting value, run the Gibbs sampler, 
for moderate number of iterations, pick the maximum, and then use that as a starting value for the optimizer. And that seemed to um, help things a little bit, because otherwise, if I was finding a different starting values, take it to different um, different local optima, which aren't always very good. So just a little bit of Gibbs sampling first seemed to seem to help without too much effort. So you can kind of see it's it's increasing the log likelihood quite quickly, quite early on. So it's getting you to a, a better place to be starting with. Okay, so in terms of the experimental design, um, now we often find with these computer models that some inputs don't do very much, or at least over the ranges that have been chosen, they're not doing very much. So in the early days, um, we tended to use product designs, but these can be quite wasteful. So suppose I've got a two input model, and I try this product design. Now, obviously this would be harder if I had large numbers of inputs, so I'd be getting very big designs. But let's say it's a two input model, and I try this product design. If I discover that input X2 doesn't really do anything in the model, because it's a deterministic model, I haven't really got three, nine data points anymore, I've got three data points, because I've replicated my x1 value three times. So the projection down in each dimension only gives me three data points. So if we've got inputs that are uninfluential, replicating input choices can be quite wasteful. So more popular are sort of space-filling, sort of stratified designs. So um, people use something called the Latin hypercube sample. That's quite a popular way of generating a design. So the idea is, in each dimension, you chop up the input region into regions of equal size, or sometimes regions of equal probability. You pick one point per region, and you do that for each dimension, and then you randomly pair them together. So if I project down in either dimension, I've got good coverage, at least, of my um, individual inputs. So if x2 turned out to do nothing, I've still got nine different values of x1 in the design. And then we'll do a little bit of refinement where we might generate lots of these samples and try and fix, pick ones that have the better sp space filling properties. But I think this sort of approach seems to be the most popular for generating, generating your inputs. Um, there's another technique that people use called the Sobel sequence. This is a deterministic sequence that produces a space filling design. Now, this has nice sequential properties in that um, the longer you run the sequence, the more it fills in the space. So, um, if I started with a, a nine point Latin hypercube design and I wanted an 18 point Latin hypercube design, I'd, I'd have to start again. If I start off with a nine point Sobel sequence and I want an 18 point Sobel sequence, I can just extend <coughs> my first nine points. So, it's better if you're working sequentially. But you find that some of the projections are quite bad. So, um, this was a 256 point design in 18 dimensions, so this is looking at the two dimensional projection for two inputs, but this is the projection for another two inputs, and you get these quite funny patterns. So um, I tend not to like these ones so much because I think you, you, you get some um, strange projections. So even though the sequential properties are better than the Latin hypercube, I still prefer the Latin hypercube. Okay, so. Um, Moving on, let's talk about some of the things we want to do with our model. So, talk about uncertainty propagation. So, let's suppose that there is. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. No, there's a lot, a lot of interest in um, sequential designs. Um, I mean, um, working on an example at the moment with quite expensive models. So I've started with a simple Latin hypercube, um, only in about 10, 20 points. But it might get up to 100 or so points. So I will think about sequentially doing it. So, yeah, there's certainly interest in that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we don't understand the literature well enough. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, we're going to suppose that there's a true uncertain value of our input. Now, there are two ways to think about this. It could be something that's fixed, we just don't know, or there could be a population value distribution of inputs. Okay? So we're going to have some distribution for this some uncertain value. 
and we're interested in what would happen if you could run the model at the true uncertain input. Alternatively, if you have a population distribution of values for inputs, what's the corresponding population of distribution out value distribution of output values? Now we consider inputs for what we call the uncertainty distribution, and this can be a little bit confusing. So the object of inference is the distribution of y given the function. But the function is uncertain, so this distribution is itself an uncertain distribution. Um, so it's slightly different from thinking about simply what's my uncertainty about y. So if I'm treating f as uncertain, and I think what's my uncertainty about y, it's got two sources of there, of uncertainty there, uncertainty about x and uncertainty about f. We want to separate those two things, so we say, suppose I could discover what f was, what would my distribution of y be? So perhaps as an example, um, perhaps my makes a bit clearer, let's suppose I've got a standard normal distribution of my inputs, and I don't know what the function is, it could be one of these two things, it could be either 1 plus x or x squared, but I don't know which. Okay? So if the function was this one, the first option, then the distribution of y would be normal. But if the function turned out to be this one, the distribution of y would be chi-squared. Okay, so if I don't know yet which of those two functions f really is, I don't know which of these two distributions y really is. And we're interested in uncertainty about the distribution of y, where rather than saying f could be one of those two things, f is modeled by a a Gaussian process. And the reason for sort of making a fuss about this is that we want to be able to say, whatever inferences we provide, we want to be able to say, supposing we keep running the model. So you only gave me 100 model runs, and I've given you some inferences about this distribution of y. What would happen if you gave me another 100? But I start telling you different things. Okay? And if we sort of merge all the uncertainty together, um, we can't answer that question. If we think about this uncertain distribution, we can say, what, how would my beliefs about the distribution change if I keep running the model? So let's take the mean of this distribution. Um, so we're looking at um, this integral here. So I think perhaps you might have heard this already. One of the nice properties of using a Gaussian process is that if f is a Gaussian process, then you can think of this integral as just a big sum of normal random variables, so that has a normal distribution. So it's a nice feature of a Gaussian process model for a function. And we can even get closed forms expressions for the mean and variance of this normal distribution under certain modeling choices. So normal distributions for the inputs, the nice exponentiated quadratic covariance function, and polynomial functions in X. That's, that's conditional on the covariance parameters, but you can actually analytically get an estimate, uh, well, a mean and variance of this uncertain quantity. So um, there's something that was done quite, sort of quite a while ago. Um, and we've also looked at the distribution of the population variance and the distribution of the, the cumulative distribution of function as well. But this paper concentrates on the, the mean and variance of, of, of y. Um, another sort of illustration of um, using emulators for, to look at the sort of uncertainty distribution. Um, now I think there's a sort of a theme here of sort of if you like sequential design, which um, sort of features in a lot of the sort of applications that we work in. So the the application was we've got a um, the modelling sewer systems, and we're thinking about excess sewage that occurs when you get a, a storm. We've got a model. Um, which estimates how much store storage volume you would need, depending on some inputs, to meet particular environmental standards. Now, I've said that we've got uncertainty in the true input values x. I actually think we've got a, here we've got a population in that distribution, so the inputs change from storm to storm. That gives you a, a, a distribution of output values, and they were particularly interested in the 95th percentile of this distribution. Okay? And we're interested in can we estimate this percentile without having to run the model too many times. So this is going to be a bit of hand-waving, but we did this with a sort of sequential approach. So we start off with a small number of model runs, get our emulator, we've got a, a basic distribution for the function. Then we generate approximate realizations of that function. So we've got a distribution of the function, 
uh, we can sample some approximate realizations. It's quite a low dimensional input space, so we just sort of simulate, we just sample extra training inputs and treat uh, the distribution conditional on that simulated data as a realization, or the, the mean, sorry. So for each realization, we then use Monte Carlo to estimate the 95th percentile of the output. So you just sample lots of inputs, run them through your realization rather than the true F, and you note the input value. And you keep doing that, and you start to build up a, a, a region where you think the inputs are going to generate your 95th percentile, the inputs that generate the large output values. Then we go back to the computer model, and we do more runs, but only in that part of the space, because the other parts of the space we're pretty sure wouldn't change our assessment of the 95th percentile. Okay? So we update the emulator. We've now got a good emulator, but only where we think we need it. Okay? In, the in, in the inputs that are going to generate these high inputs, these high outputs, elsewhere it's more uncertain. But we know enough to, to know that that's not where we're going to see the, the 95th percentile. So we had a, a fairly simple test example. We had four uncertain inputs. <coughs> um, I started off with just 16 evaluations of the model for this stage. Did this lots of times, then identified a further eight inputs that I thought would be in the, the region of the important region. And we did comparisons with various Monte Carlo samples. So uh, we've got, so this isn't very clear, we've got pointwise estimates of the, the CDF and bounds on that. So those bounds represent the fact that I don't know exactly what the function is. I've only got my 24 evaluation. <coughs> Here we've got just direct Monte Carlo sampling estimating the CDF based on different sample sizes. So you're kind of really, if you're interested in the CDF at 90 95th percentile, you're kind of reading across that way. Okay. So with 24 runs, it was kind of comparable with what you might get with 1,000 um, Monte Carlo evaluations. And certainly quite a bit better than sort of moderate Monte Carlo sample sizes. Okay. So moving on, um, something that sort of is interesting, but perhaps uh, less mature in the uh, sort of use of Gaussian process is this, this idea of validating and uh, coming up with diagnostics for a Gaussian process model. So I'll be talking mainly about stuff that was done um, uh, in this paper, but I still think it's kind of an unfinished story. There's still quite a lot we don't yet understand about this. So here's a motivating example. I've got a model, and I'm interested in that uncertainty propagation problem. So I've got an uncertain input x, some distribution. I want to assess my uncertainty in y. And Monte Carlo approach would be we sample a load of inputs from our input distribution, run them through the model, and that gives us a sample from y. And then if I want to estimate the mean or the CDF, etc., I can do that. And as long as my n's reasonably large, um, central limit kicks in and I can get in some sense reliable standard errors I can sort of I would, I would trust that the intervals would have good coverage okay. so that's using Monte Carlo but let's suppose now that the model is computationally expensive so I can't use this approach I'm going to do my analysis based on an emulator so let's say the emulator gives me an estimate it says well we think the, this, this population mean is, is 50, but a 95% credible interval of 48 to 52, and similar for the CDF. Okay? So what these intervals are representing are what would happen if you were to keep running the computer model? How do you think your estimate of the mean might change? Okay? So we're saying we're 95% certain that if I knew the function f everywhere, the mean value, the y evaluated at f of x would be in this range. So, kind of a slightly strange question, but can we really trust these intervals? Okay. Can I sort of, am I, am I happy to say I'm 95% certain that this quantity really does lie in that range based on what I've got from my Gaussian process emulator? Now, you can take a, a sort of hardcore subjective line and you can say, well, it's a subjective judgment, it is what it is. Okay. Maybe it's a sensible interval, maybe it's not. But in practice, when we're using Gaussian processes, we're making all sorts of compromises and, and, and assumptions. And I think it, it is worth interrogating whether you can really feel comfortable with the intervals that you're reporting based on your Gaussian process model. 
And so, in some sense, and again, this is a bit vague, but we want to assess whether that GP emulator is a sensible statistical model for our computer model F. If we're overconfident, if we give bounds that are too tight, that might lead to poor decisions, we might mis mislead someone. If we're underconfident, if we give bounds that are too, too, uh, too big, that might sort of dev devalue the analysis. Someone might say, oh, you can't trust that model, look at the uncertainty that you're reporting. But maybe we're being um, underconfident. So a couple of examples of what we might be looking for. So in these plots, my blue curve would be the computer model. Sorry, I've changed from F to E, so these are old, thi old figures. So the blue curve is the computer model. The dashed line would be the emulator mean and the solid lines would be point-wise 95% balance. Okay? So in both cases we've got emulators that we don't like very much. So this one is actually the mean predicts really well but you're reporting these really big bounds and in practice when you don't know what the true function is you might be reporting way too much uncertainty. So this will be a very underconfident emulator. This one's more obviously would be an overconfident emulator because you've got regions of inputs where the true function is way outside the bounds you're reporting. Okay? So can we diagnose this given that we don't know what the, the whole real function is going to be? So the traditional approach, and this is certainly very useful, is sort of leave one out cross-validation. So you might take out one training data point, you use your remaining training data to make a prediction, perhaps you look at the uncertainty as well. So you might look at the emulator mean against that point that you've taken out, perhaps with some error bars, you might look at standardised prediction errors against predictive values and so on. Now this is certainly useful and this is something that I always do, but it's not the whole story. One of the problems is that we've got a correlation in these prediction errors. Okay? We're not really accounting for the fact that um, you know, if the emulator predicts badly in one part of the input space, it's going to predict badly in that, in that region. So the prediction errors aren't independent. And it's still quite hard to judge sometimes if the uncertainty that we're reporting is, is appropriate. And again, in, in, in real problems, when we're using this in anger, we are going to have quite substantial uncertainty. Uh, we're not going to, we can't always rely on really nailing down what the function is doing. So this is important. So the idea is um, we run our, our computer model, we get our training data, we fit our Gaussian process emulator. Then we're going to choose some further validation inputs. Now, you could actually um, start with the training data and just partition it into you know, training and, and, and validation, but we're going to imagine you've chosen some, some um, training data, we're now going to choose some more validation inputs. And we don't really know too much about what, what the best choices of these validation inputs might be, but we, we, we think it's helpful to, to sort of consider a range where You've got some validation inputs that are quite close to training inputs. You've got some validation inputs that are further away. You've got validation inputs that are close to each other but are further away from the training data and so on. So we look at the, what the emulator is predicting. We'll look at how much uncertainty we're reporting. Then we run the simulator again. So we're now going to observe some validation data and we can look at what the predictions are relative to the emulator uncertainty. And then there's a couple of things that we might do with the validation data. First thing is you might take all those prediction errors and come up with a single measure of fit using a mile nervous distance. So I've got my vector of validation data there, I've got my vector of emulator predictions or means, I've got my emulator uncertainty which is the variance covariance matrix of the data and you can think of this as like a hypothesis test. If that data really does come from a Gaussian process, this thing should follow an F distribution. So you can look at the observed value of this statistic compared with what you might expect to see if the data really had come from a Gaussian process. So that gives you one thing you might do as a sort of a hypothesis test for um, a good emulator. Um, another thing we, we um, do is because we've got correlation in the um, prediction errors. Um, we can transform them to independence using uh, Klesky decomposition. Now in, in particular we use the pivoted Klesky decomposition of the variance covariance matrix. So just to sort of explain what's, what's going on there. So I've got my validation design points. 
I'm going to calculate my variance, covariance matrix of the outputs at these five points. And I'm going to do a pivoted Kolesky decomposition. And what that does is that gives me the Kolesky gives me a Kolesky square root, but it also reorders the data. And the idea is that the first point is the point with the largest variance. The second point is the la point with the largest variance conditional on the first. So let's say for sake of argument, suppose that uh, uncertainty is biggest at these two inputs. Okay? So let, let's pretend that this, this bound is the widest one. When you do the pivoted Kolesky decomposition, the ordering you get is that one of these might be chosen as first, but conditional on one of these points, the variance of the second point would shrink because it's, it's close to the first. So in the pivoting order, it might then, even though this one to start with had variant, large variance, conditional on the first, this has small variance, and it might jump over to a different point. So we've kind of got this ordering, and then we plot the errors in terms of the order, and you can sort of interpret, well, there's several things to spot. Firstly, we now transform to independence, so each error should approximately be standard normal 0.1 if the data really did come from a Gaussian process. Secondly, you can look at the, the plot of error in their pivoting order, and the only points correspond to where you're most uncertain, so points that are far away from the training data, and that's telling you something about how the emulator behaves where you're far from the training data. The points at the end of the sequence are telling you a look at conservative points, validation points that are either close to training data or they're close to each other. So that's telling you about <coughs> what's happening over the sort of shorter, um, shorter ranges. So, are you have you estimated the function to be too wiggly so that you're not properly learning from from data when they're when they're nearby? Okay. Um, so this is sort of an example of what you might see. So let's suppose again the blue function is the the true emulator. Um, uh, the we've got train data here, we've got emulated predictions on the intervals. So imagine we're going to look at predictions over a range of points. We do this sort of pivoting order, so we start off with validation points where we're most uncertain, and the prediction errors are going to be a little bit larger, but they're still quite small. We're expecting a range of values between sort of minus 2 and plus 2, and you can see all the prediction errors are too small because we're too underconfident. But as you move along the sequence, the prediction errors jump to being smaller because you can kind of see that you know, you've got two points here, then all the way in between, conditional on those two, you're predicting very accurately. So at points that are either close to training data points or close to validation points, um, uh, you predict very accurately and you get the even smaller uh, transformation errors. So just a couple of illustrations of this. Um, so this was for the uh, this is for a model with 18 inputs, and I started off with a constant mean function. So this is just your standard sort of cross validation plot. So you've got predictions against true values, and you've got your 95% error bars there. It's not looking too bad. One or two that perhaps a little bit too far away. If I do a QQ plot, um, now these these points aren't independent, so. Um, Strictly, we should, should be sort of drawing bounds for correlated points, but it's not following the normal distribution so well. And you can kind of see that there's quite a few when we tra uh, transform to um, independence. There's quite a few errors that are a little bit too large. Um, I don't really know what to make of the interpretation in terms of the sequence order. Um, and finally, the Marlowe this distance test there, we can see we're, we're failing because we're prediction errors are a little bit bigger than, than, than we'd like them to be. And then we switch to a linear mean function, or if you like a linear term, your covariance function, um, and this generally behaves a little bit better. We kind of get things that are looking a little bit more norm normal here. Not so many prediction errors outside the ranges that we're expecting, and the mano of this distance was at least what we'd expect to see if the data had come from a, um, a climate, uh, a, ga a Gaussian process. I think this is still kind of. Um, work in progress. Uh, there's, I think there's a lot more that we can do to try and understand or think about how we use these plots and think about how they might guide emulator modeling choices. It's still a little bit um, unclear at the moment.
but I, I certainly think the whole sort of area of diagnostics is, is an important one. It's um, particularly when we've got problems where we haven't got much data, and there is going to be substantial uncertainty. So just all, I mean, all this is valid for non-emulator modelling as well, isn't it? Um, what sort of model would you like to model? Well, in general regression, che model checking in this way is reasonable for general regression. You could apply yeah. these techniques for uh, just regression on a data set and then splitting mm. into a validation. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of inspired by that. I suppose the main <coughs> distinction, although people have done this with regression models as well, is that you've got the, the, the very standard stuff assumes independent observations. And with a Gaussian process, you're not treating the data yeah. points is independent. Yeah, but I mean, regression modeling with Gaussian process, sorry, Gaussian process. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's the sort of thing, yeah. you could take, I, I'm not, I don't know, I haven't seen so much work on validation and calibration of Gaussian mm. process models in general, but this just applies generally to Gaussian process. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then what do you do at the end of this when, when your client then says, can you now throw validation points into the training set and build a better model um, based on the calibration points as well? Uh, well, um, uh, well, we just you know, use them. I think the, perhaps the, the, the real question is, how might for a real problem, how might you decide? How, you've got a fixed budget. How do you decide how much building and validation data to have? Um, we don't know. So I think there. Are, sorry. Um, that's there any proper scoring rules? Um. <laughs> Leo looked at this in his, his thesis a lot. Um, I didn't really know what to make of them, to be honest. I really like them. I, I think it's great down to calibration and reliability and calibration, uh, sharpness and calibration. Yeah. Um, it seems really good, about, but I've never, never really used them in anger. I think in the, I, I guess, in the traditional sense of those scoring rules, they're perhaps more suited to independent predictions. Yeah. And I guess they're a bit more fiddly for correlated predictions. Um, I'm not sure what we we'll do now. I was scheduled to go into half five, but that seems a bit late. Or um, I have no idea about schedule. <laughs> no, but that's, uh, well, we can finish up now if we're um, happy to. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, plenty more I could talk about, but I, I just feel it's. Well, I've been right. going for an hour. And Stop for questions and, uh, and, and see yeah. what, um, and maybe there'll be questions about stuff. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, so just thank Jeremy for the. If I, if I could just skip to my, my very last slide, um, there's a bit of a cheeky plug in here. Um, uh, see, usually too much. Um, mm -hmm. Just wanted to make a little plug. Um, if you're interested in Gaussian processes, and you like Sheffield, and why wouldn't you? Um, we're having a conference uh, in July um, on all things Gaussian process and computer models. Uh, and we're, even if it's not directly computer model related, we're certainly very interested in any Gaussian process research that people are doing. So we would welcome abstracts, submissions, either talks or posters on Gaussian process methods, Gaussian processes in computer models, and so on. Anyway, back to questions. Questions. I was just you said you said near the start this thing about not replacing the proper models. Why not? You mean the thing about the biologist complaining yeah. you're taking all my biology out? Um well all, the way we use the Gaussian process, um, all we're doing is replicating the model ones that, we, that we're given. So they're not replaced because they are replicated. If we had fitted a model that didn't interpolate exactly, um, then, um, uh, then we would be replacing it. But because it, we don't put a noise, it, it replicates those ones exactly. So that's, that's really the sense in which I'm saying we don't replace the model because we use the model runs, we use the data that, that you can get from the model. Um, a bit later on, um, which I won't talk about, we do analyses where we recognise that these models aren't perfect, we don't trust them completely, and that's where we bring in a second Gaussian process to represent the model error. So ultimately, we do think about going beyond the model itself, but initially, um, 
we just try and get the most value possible out of the model ones that we have. Um, I, I'm not aware of any advantage of well I haven't really understood if there's an advantage of the way we write the model down in terms of you know, the mean function or putting things into covariance but in terms of having those trend terms in definitely there are examples where it helps um, because otherwise you know, if you just have a, a stationary Gaussian process for a function which has got trends in then the stationary Gaussian process doesn't do a very good job Um, again, if you're, um, I can imagine there's, there's definitely advantages into modelling the, the periodicity, um, as, you, as you've described, absolutely. But again, the, the question of do you put that term into the mean or do you put that term into the covariance, um, it may not make any difference. I think it's, it's, in some sense it's splitting hairs because, I mean, in, you've got a sense of which Jeremy, when he talked about the Gaussian process covariance part, he, t he said it was the residual covariance. Mm -hmm. Which, t to me, implies he's thinking of that as sort of noise, corrupting additional stuff on top of things, uh, like the errors of the residuals. So it's taking care, so they're using the Gaussian process, the non-parametric bit, to correct, to ensure that the true model is represented at the design point. But it's traditional in statistics to want interpretable parametric models. And so... The, the feeling is the other bit is an mm. interpretable mm. parametric model that you can talk about and reason about. So from that perspective, you get the best of both worlds. But it's just a matter of emphasis. If, I mean, I would build the same model. I would potentially do the longer term trend in the way that, Jeremy, it was interesting you mentioned the uh, other paper where they, they use a Gaussian process for the mean function, mm. you'd say. That's probably how I would choose to do it. But actually, the, I bet the result wouldn't be so different and I don't know I guess it, it's a difference in emphasis and what you're wanting out of the model at the end of the day um, there's no right or wrong but, I mean actually I like the idea that this is I was trying to emphasize we were talking earlier weren't we but I was trying to say but well, maybe it's not helpful to say mean function covariance function maybe it's like a parametric part and non-parametric part mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's sort of a, perhaps a better way of seeing those two parts I don't know other questions? Rich? What can you do if your simulator is stochastic? Um, well, the exam the sorts of stochastic models I work in is where the, um, the model does a kind of an internal Monte Carlo simulation. So you choose your inputs and it, it does replications. And, it re um, and then if you're, that's what you want to model. Um, if you want to model the mean, you've already got a good estimate of what the stochastic noise part is. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy just to put that into the, the covariance. Um, sometimes, though, um, it's more interesting if you, you might actually want to model that whole distribution, and that's a bit less clear to me. The sort of things I've done, we've tended just to model the mean output of a stochastic model. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a meaningful question at all, but um, so you, with the diagnostics, the idea is you uh, want to know whether your um, credibility intervals are meaningful or not. Mm. Is it also possible to do the other way around, saying that you 
give yourself a, uh, you give yourself a, a credibility, and then you ask, how do I have to uh, design the, the <coughs> inputs such that I will be both correct and and in, in my interval sort of size? So you you decide you want to know something with a particular credibility, yeah. um, and then what does it you want to do? You want to you want to know how to, to set up the evaluation such that okay. you will be both correct and in the Okay, so I guess there's sort of two parts to that. There's I'm not going to give any well, not thought about this, can't give you detail, but the two aspects would be um, the traditional GP modelling. You've got to, let's say, data that you think really comes from a GP, and you've set yourself this criteria. And you want to think, what inputs do I choose that reduce my uncertainty about the function so that I predict whatever it is I want to know with that, that credibility? Um, but separate to that, and whatever method you come up with, um, we're using GPs to represent subjective opinion about fixed functions. And there's always going to be that separate question of whatever it is you want to do, is the GP a sensible model for this function, and how do we tell? And the diagnostic part doesn't really go away. It doesn't change, given the, the, the way you set up the problem, I think. Okay. Um, so, so you talked about the, sa the sampling of the hyperparameters rather than maximum likelihood of plugging mm. them in. Yes. Um, and you said you didn't think it was very important. Uh, I, I kind of, kind of increasingly think, I increasingly think it is important that it, um, but that it doesn't make an effect, particularly if your covariance function is misspecified. Uh, but, but on the sampling, you were using Gibbs sampling there, were you? Um, yes. Uh, so for the lens scale, did you have Metropolis Hastings? Yes, Metropolis yeah. within Gibbs. Oh, is that working okay? Yeah. Good. I mean, I've um, I tried it on that climate model. Um, ben suggested it on his um, uh, lab model. And Pinto. Tasting. Okay, so uh, there's no other questions. If we could just thank Jeremy again. Uh, so, James, uh, where's James? What, what time? When are you going to meet for six o'clock? We meet here.